Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to E304. Today we're going to continue our discussion of um, electron confinement and talk about a little bit about tunneling. So in the previous lecture, we discussed how by decreasing the particle size or the volume of, um, of our um, material, we can confine an electron. We talked about conductors and semiconductors. Um, so when we do that, when we confine an electron, essentially uh, the model that we can use to visualize that is the particle in a well model that we saw previously in chapter three. And so um, this, is, this is a finite quantum well, so it has some finite barrier height on each side. And we remember from chapter three that there are some discrete energy levels that can exist within this well and the length of the swell um, is, is the size of our quantum particle or quantum dot. Of course, if we're talking about a quantum dot here, there would be a three-dimensional well, not just a one-dimensional well, but for simplicity, I'll just draw the one dimension here. So what I want us to remember <clears throat> from chapter three is that the wave, the square of the wave function, psi squared, uh, that gives us the probability of finding the electron at a particular spot in the uh, quantum well is looks something like this for lower energy levels and then as you go up in energy level it begins to look something more like this okay and the key uh, here is that we saw that there were some finite probability. Remember, the square of the wave function gives us the probability of finding the, the electron at a particular location. So there's some finite probability, some probability that the electron exists outside of the well. And that's what we know as tunneling. So if we have a quantum barrier, not just a well, but let's just look at a barrier. The barrier has some finite thickness and it has some energy. Um, let's call the energy E barrier. And let's say that we have an electron that's on this side of the barrier and the electron has some energy uh, or particle, if it's not an electron, has some particle energy EP. And we have the wave function of this particle. Okay, we know that there's some probability that it will exist somewhere in this barrier. And then we also know that there's some probability that it will exist on the other side of the barrier even though the energy of the particle is lower than the barrier. So this is what we know as tunneling. Well, the implication of this is that even in a quantum dot, there is a probability that the electron can escape that dot and exist outside it. Uh, well, if any electron can tunnel whenever it wants, according to this probability, then really what's the point? Are we really confining it? So in order to, to truly keep an electron in the well and keep it confined and quantized, we have to have some control about when electrons tunnel in and then tunnel out of these quantum dots. So there's two rules that govern this quantum confinement. And we'll talk about those next. So rule number one for making sure that electrons tra trapped in a quantum well stay trapped in that quantum well is called the um, quantum or the Coulomb blockade. Okay, so what this means is that if we have some barriers and we have some electrons that are stuck in a well between these two um, energy barriers. These are all negatively charged electrons. And what do we know about the electrostatic forces between these? Well, we know that a whole bunch of negative charges repel each other. So the walls of the quantum well uh, hold the electron to electrons together. So these walls hold 
electrons together. And the electrons themselves, the fact that they're all negatively charged, means that they're repelling each other's each other. Okay, so the this electrostatic force, this re repulsive force between these uh, electrons, keeps other electrons from coming in. Okay, and the rule that governs that is the following. The energy EC that is required for an electron to beat this this Coulomb blockade force and tunnel in. So the energy needed to add one more electron to this uh, well or to this dot must be greater than must be much greater than the energy that an electron is willing to give up in order to tunnel. Okay, so EC is the energy needed to add one more electron to the dot and KBT is the energy that uh, any electron might get from the thermal vibrations in the lattice. So this burst of energy can cause is what causes electrons to, to tunnel. Uh, so as long as it costs more energy to tunnel than the energy that an electron might get from the normal thermal vibrations in the lattice, then it won't tunnel in or out of the barrier. Uh, so let's define what this energy EC is. We know that KB is Boltzmann's constant and T is temperature. So that's uh, we know that. But let's talk about EC a little bit, make sure we know what EC is. So that energy of adding an electron is equal to some geomet geometric term that depends on the geometry of your of your well, the permittivity of the material, epsilon, and d, the diameter of our dot. Okay, um, I'm sorry, this isn't um, made a mistake. This is the capacitance uh, of the dot. Okay, so the capacitance of the dot is this geometrical term times the material permittivity times the diameter of the dot. So this is how much charge the quantum dot can store. How much charge can be store, stored in the dot, okay? So from that, then we can talk about the energy required to add an additional charge. So EC is equal to the charge of an electron squared, E is a charge on an electron, divided by twice the capacitance, C dot. Okay? So in order to keep an electron confined, this uh, equation must be met. And uh, this is the equation for EC um, here. Now, rule number two. Rule number two has to do with the uncertainty principle. Okay. So what rule number two tells us is, uh, if we remember back to... Um, we talked about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Another way of writing Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is to say that the change or the uncertainty in the energy in the system's energy is approximately equal to H over the uncertainty in the time we have to measure it. So you can't know both the time and the total system energy at the same time. And this particular equation, dt, becomes the time constant of the capacitor. So the amount of time it takes to charge or to add all the charges into that quantum dot, assuming that that quantum dot acts, acts like a capacitor, like we saw on the previous slide. So delta t is going to be equal to rt times 
C dot. So it has to do with the capacitance and the resistance. <coughs> so uh, the rule here is that the uncertainty in the energy it takes to add another electron to the well must be less than or equal to the actual energy it takes to add that electron. So this is where the key um, of this rule is. In other words, in, a, in order to avoid random tunneling that we aren't uh, controlling, the un our uncertainty and the amount of energy it takes to add an electron has to be less than the actual energy it takes to um, chart to add an electron to the capacitor. So this is rule number two, and it can be boiled down to if we uh, substitute uh, dt is equal to rt c dot, and we substitute our equation for ec from the previous slide. Uh, this boils down to uh, h over rt c dot must be less than uh, the charge squared over 2c dot. And if we simplify that a little bit further, it tells us that rt must be much, much greater than H over E squared. Okay? So in other words, what this is telling us is that we want a very, very high resistance in order to keep that electron confined. So usually we get this by making a very thick insulator around the quantum well. And that keeps our, our electron confined. So now these are the we have the two rules for keeping an electron confined. And the last thing we want to talk about is how do we use uh, our ability to manipulate electrons in quantum wells to um, achieve some really neat applications like the single electron transistor.